This morning, we wrap up our series entitled The Hunt. We began this on, on Easter Sunday, and we've been looking at a couple of different things that, that, that humanity hunts for, right? We talked about the hunt for something to believe in. We talked about the hunt for a clean slate. Last week, we talked about the hunt for validation. And this morning, we're going to take a look at the hunt for freedom. Uh, the hunt for freedom. We're going to end it up uh, with that this morning. And uh, to do that, we're going to take a look at a, a conversation that Jesus was having with some religious leaders and some Jews uh, in my, my peeps uh, back in um, uh, John chapter 8. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, let's take a look together. And uh, man, if I knew that, I'd be doing a Seder dinner. Uh, but the next one, I'm, I'm going full garb here. Um, John chapter 8. Uh, if you have your Bibles, let's turn there together. Um, so at this point, Jesus, just for context, Jesus uh, just gets done explaining to the crowd that he is the light of the world. Uh, what a profound statement, right? The one who, who, who at the beginning spoke to the darkness and said, let there be light, and the darkness is expelled. And Jesus is like, I am the light of the world. He that follows me will never walk in darkness and will have the light of life within him. And Jesus is just wrecking the crowd here and with these profound words. The religious leaders are going nuts because the religious leaders had nothing to offer people like that. I mean, it was Jesus is bringing uh, life and encouragement and, and connection with God. The religious leaders, really all they brought to the table was uh, the fruit of their conversations made people feel disconnected with God, made people feel you know, guilty about themselves and shameful about themselves and Jesus comes and, and brings, the, who is the light of life, um, brings hope and, and encouragement to the people. And then he says something here in 30, verse 31 of, of chapter 8, and he, and he says uh, to the he says this to the Jews who had believed in him, he says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth. And here it is, and the truth will set you free. If you are my disciples, you'll abide in my word, right? And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we're the offspring of Abraham, and we've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? And Jesus answered and said, truly, truly, I, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And the slave does not remain in the house forever, but, but a son remains forever. And so, Jesus says, so if the son sets you free, say it with me, you are free indeed. If the son sets you free, you are free indeed. What I find interesting about this conversation that Jesus is having with the Jews here is that they are not aware of their need for freedom. They're not aware of the fact that they are enslaved, that they are in bondage. And what Jesus is saying to them is, man, I am the light of the world. I am the light of life. And he that believes in my word, he that he shall be set free. What's interesting, too, is that these people obviously didn't know their history either, Gene. Because what, what do they say? They say, Jesus, we're the offspring of Abraham. We've never been enslaved to anyone. Really? What were you guys like on vacation in Egypt for 400 years? Right? Remember the whole like let my people go thing, right? Like, I mean, if there's one thing that historically they can look back on, I mean, like that whole Passover thing that they experienced like year after year after year was a reminder of the freedom that God gave them as he brought them out of slavery. And they're like, we've, we've never been enslaved to anyone. Isn't ignorance bliss? How will you, Jesus, how will you say you'll become free? They had no clue, not only that they were in need of freedom themselves that moment, but they had no clue of even their own history of, of, of freedom that they've experienced in God. I think, I think they represent our humanity, our culture pretty well today. Because I think people today aren't aware, like the Jews, that they're in bondage either. I don't think that, they, that, that our culture, not, not you, of course, but, but you know, everybody else that, that's not in our building right now <laughs> or listening online, 
right? I think our culture today is not aware of the fact that they're living in bondage, that they're living void of the freedom that we can have in Jesus Christ. And, and just like the Jews were like, yeah, we, you know, we've never been enslaved. Uh, they were speaking as people who were enslaved. They were unaware of their present condition. And I think that represents the, our culture today because I think, our, I think our culture today, whether they realize it or not, and many of them don't, they are on a hunt for freedom. They're on a hunt for freedom. This morning I want to talk about four areas that Jesus brings freedom into our lives. Now there's a, there's a lot of areas that Jesus brings freedom into our lives. We can, we can spend months just talking about some of the, the blessed benefits that we have uh, because of Jesus and the freedom that we uh, experience because of that. But this morning we're going to take a look at four uh, areas of freedom, right? The, the hunt for freedom. Four areas of freedom that Jesus brings to our life. The first one is freedom from vices. Freedom from vices. This kind of popped in my head last week as I was, as, as, as I was speaking to you about the hunt for, for validation. And we were, we were listening to God speaking through the prophet um, Jeremiah to the people. And, and I, as I came across something there, something kind of leaped in my heart last week that I thought I need to bring this next week because I think that there's something uh, in there that, that represents um, our, our culture today. God is speaking through the prophet Jeremiah and he says, be appalled, O heavens, at this. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 12. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. We, Lord, we looked at this last week. God says, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they've hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. You see, you and I were made in the image of God. You know that? I appreciated what Kenny was saying this morning, like, we're going to worship God forever. Now, if like, for some people, that's kind of like, yeah. And for other people, like, like we're going to sing forever? Like, I know I'm supposed to really be excited about that, but like, what does that mean? Here, here, here's the, imagine I said to you that you are going to um, applaud forever. That's not really exciting unless something is going on around you that makes you want to applaud forever. <laughs> Right? Imagine I said to you, you're going hey, to worship forever. Well, maybe on this side of eternity, that's really hard for us to wrap our arms around. But here's the thing. When we get on over to the other side, right? when we cross out of time and into eternity, and we are forever with the Lord, the experience we're going to have in the presence of God. You know, the reality of it is everything that God wants us to know about him on this side of eternity is seen in the person of Jesus Christ. But there's so much more to discover that God is going to reveal to us when we're over there. And I think that when we get on over to the other side and we start to see all the things that God has created that our limited thinking can, can, can possibly embrace, it is going to create in us a desire to want to worship God forever and ever. I think it is the worship that we're going to be doing is not going to be a chore. It's going to be a response. It's going to be a response for this connection that we have with God that is going to want, they're going to create in us a need, a desire to want to worship God forever. You see, God, is, God has created us in, in, in his image and he has designed us in such a way that, that creation is dependent upon creator. There's just something in our makeup that, that, that desires to be in community, in unity with God. And, and the reality of it is people, hey, we talked about that God-shaped hole in our heart last week. And people try to fill that God-shaped hole in their heart with so many other things other than God himself. And eventually they, they, all those things, they run out. And, but only God can fill that need. Only God can fill that, that craving. Everything, the, everything else is a chase after something that only God can give. God's designed us that way. 
And the reality of it is he's, he, it, it's, it's through our connection with our creator that, 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 that this creation and, and uh, connects with our creator. And then it's there that we find our, our fulfillment. It's there that we find our purpose. It's where we find our validation, as we talked about uh, last week. But when people turn from that design, when creation turns its back on creator, turns from the source of, of living water, turns from the one who, who gives us our, our sense of purpose, and they're left feeling unfulfilled. They're, they're left feeling thirsty. They're left feeling broken. They're left feeling needy, looking for something to quench that thirst that only God can quench. And they're on a hunt. They're on a chase, trying to fill with some vice, some thing other than what God has designed to fill that space in our heart. And as God declares to Jeremiah, they are turning to broken cisterns, incapable of holding water. Things that are incapable of, of giving them what they're really searching after. God presented himself as the fountain of living water. Everything they needed was found in their relationship with God. And he's rebuking them and saying, you've turned from the fountain of living water and you've created these vices, these broken, you've gotten these broken cisterns and you've put water in them, but the water can't stay in the broken cistern. And you're left wanting, turning to vices. What they did then, they, we do today. People haven't changed one bit. In the same way that they were on the chase to fill that God-shaped hole in their heart, our culture is doing the same thing. I want you to know vices come in all shapes and sizes, don't they? For some, those, those vices are drugs. Things that dull their senses and bring them to places chemically. For some, it's sex. Seeking the ultimate relationship, the ultimate feeling, the ultimate fulfillment, the ultimate intimacy, only to discover that there is no sexual experience that you're ever going to have that's going to bring the kind of fulfillment that only God can bring. Especially when it's twisted and distorted and outside the design for sexuality that God has put in motion. The vices of money. I need more money so I can buy some more stuff only to discover that that's not going to satisfy. And so more money will allow me to buy some more stuff only to try it on and to realize that doesn't do it either, but I still need some more money because maybe there's some more. Do you see the cycle? It just continues to go and it leaves people wanting. It is a vibe. Perhaps the vice is power. I just need to feel validated. I just need to feel like when I walk in the room, people recognize who it is that's in their presence. And so I need to present myself and polish myself and do whatever I can so people will realize that I'm not that little boy or that little girl that I really feel like I am in my heart. These vices, they can be different for every person, but the goal is the same. It's a desire to feel complete. It's a desire to feel whole. A desire to feel valued. And for so many in our culture, that pursuit of some form of a vice oftentimes leads to, to an addiction and leaves people in, in bondage. The thing that, that, that so many think they control it masters them because sin will take you further than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay. And so something that you 
played with becomes your master and is a full-blown addiction. And we see it all over today. I think of the opioid, opioid crisis, and there's nothing less than that in our culture today. It's worse than it has ever been before. It makes the 60s look tame. Just reading a news day the other day, there's 600 opiate-related deaths just on Long Island in 2017, 400 of which took place right in, here backyard, in our backyard of Suffolk County. 400 lives wrecked. Mothers and fathers burying their children. Kids burying their parents. I mean, lives turned upside down. For what? The chase of, the, of a buzz. They'll never satisfy. It's a dark day. It's an epidemic. And it's here in our own backyard. People are in bondage and in the need of, the, of a freedom that only God can give. And I, I just want to tell you, man, there's, for, for those who are struggling, whether you're, whether you're here or listening online, or, or where, there's hope in Jesus Christ. There's, there's healing in Jesus Christ. There's help in Jesus Christ. You don't have to suffer. It's not God's will for you. Jesus said that he that the Son sets free is free indeed. And I want you to know this morning that God is able to take those addictions, those things that, pow- that, that, that people are under the power of, and break it by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not just, it's not just drugs, though. People are in bondage to pornography in catastrophic proportions. It's changing the way men see women and women see men. It's perverting and distorting God's design for sexuality in the confines of a marriage relationship between a husband and a wife, a male and a female. Isn't that a shame we have to keep, keep defining? Internet pornography is at an all-time high. It used, to be a, it used to be a guy's problem, and now... Studies show that just as many women are addicted to, 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 to internet pornography, not as many, but close to 60% of women addicted. And you can't think that you can watch that and think it's not going to change the way you view your spouse, change the way you view the opposite sex, change the way you view yourself. It's poison. And I want you to know, there's no victimless, it's not a victimless crime. You can't see that and it not change the way you view God's design for sexuality. We're living in a culture of young people where this is so normal and, 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 and the, the promiscuity, it, it is creating a culture of young people that are going to have to really be trained on God's design for sexuality. And if this is something you're messing with in the dark, I implore you as your pastor, don't think for one second that you're controlling it. It's controlling you. It's changing you. And you're usually the last person to see it. People are in bondage to this. This is not... God's design. Jesus came to set us free from those things. And, and what ends up happening these, in these, in the, in, in, with, in, 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 with um, the more they engage in these kinds of things, it, eventually it starts manifesting itself. These quiet things in the dark that nobody thinks is going on starts to manifest itself in outbursts of anger and rage and abuse. Oftentimes, not every time, but oftentimes, when you get to the core of why people are responding to, in, in, in wrath and rage and anger, there's a, there's, a, there's a foundation of lust and perversion underneath that, 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 that fuels that thing. Jesus said, he that the sun sets free. You got quiet in here. But you know what? This is real, man. 
This is true. This is, this is affecting our kids. This is affecting our families. This is affecting our culture. This is not God's plan. God has so much better for us. He has so much more for us. There's so much more freedom that God wants us to walk in. It's the enemy that wants to keep people in bondage. It's the enemy that wants to redefine what God has called holy and good. And we need to start speaking up about it and speaking up against it and putting some healthy parameters around your inter- internet time and your TV time and, and those things that you allow to creep into your mind. Jesus said, he that the Son says, free is free indeed. There's healing and there's hope. There's help. There's freedom in Jesus, the, the fountain of living water. Jesus came to set us free from, from vices, whatever vice that may be. Anything we lean on, if not held in proper moderation, if it's permissible, and distance, if it's not, becomes a vice. The hunt for freedom is the hunt for freedom from vices. Secondly, the freedom from, from guilt. That's what Jesus brings. Jesus brings a freedom from guilt. You see, you may be listening to this this morning, and I've, I've just completely, totally stepped on your toes. You might be here this morning and thinking, does he know what I'm going through right now? I might complete, you might sit, be sitting here and feeling guilty about what I just said. And you see, the reality is that the church is, is oftentimes full of people who have, who have come out of those things. Have you heard that? Have you heard people say, well, you know, the, the problem with those churches is there's a lot of people that, why is it that there's always like ex-alcoholics and ex-drug addicts and ex-broken marriage? And it just seems like there's a whole bunch of dysfunctional people in the church. They seem to be really unhealthy. Jesus said, I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the, the sick. And see, what ends up happening is for so many people in humanity, they start searching and trying to fill those voids with drugs and alcohol and relationships and everything else, only to find that none of it satisfies. And they find themselves thrown in the street, only to be met up with the master who picks us up and brushes us off and validates us as people, brings dignity back to our life, it says, maybe nobody else wants you, but you're mine. Churches are full of them. And I love it. The redeemed, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. One of the strongest emotions, though, that people have, especially when we're open and honest enough um, to recognize where we sin against God, sin against ourselves, and sin against other people, one of the strongest emotions that we can feel is, is guilt. Um, sometimes that guilt is something that was passed on down from, from maybe your, your upbringing. Maybe it was a part of some religious system that you were in, where everything was driven by guilt. You had to do this, or you, know, you were only as good as the last thing you did for somebody, and you always felt guilty all the time. You see, the reality of it is that that Jesus sets us free from the power of guilt. I think one of the stories that that really comes to my mind when I think about this idea of guilt is here's Jesus and he's on the cross, right? And we have got a contrast of of two different people, each on one side of him, right? On 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 that Good Friday. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me or take a look at the screen. Luke 23 it kind of captures the, 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 the thieves on the cross next to Jesus. Luke 23, it says, And one of the criminals who were hanged, railed, who was hanged alongside him, who were hanged, railed at him. Now, you've got to be like, you know, like, you've got to be really disconnected from reality to be thinking like you're about to die. And the first, what's on your mind is an argument. Right? One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Like, hey man, you're Jesus, right? Aren't you able to do something about this? I mean, here we are, everybody's looking at us. Man, you're Jesus, right? Save yourself, and by the way, save, save us as well. 
That's a real gracious appeal. But the other person rebukes him, saying, don't you fear God since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? I love that. It's like, don't you fear the God you're about to stand in front of? You're about to die. Don't you fear God since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And then he says, look, and we indeed, we're justly under condemnation. For we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man, Jesus, has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you today, uh, you'll be with me in paradise. What, a, what an incredible contrast we see here. I believe with all my heart that was placed there for us to kind of really realize that, that you don't need to know much more than Jesus is Savior, please save me. I think sometimes we put some real big hoops in place for people to say, well, you know, you're really not going to the kingdom unless you, you've got all these different doctrines in place and you need to understand this and that and the other thing. And what this guy is like, just save me. And Jesus said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. What this guy realized is, I'm guilty. I'm deserving of death. You're innocent. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. The other guy didn't acknowledge his guilt. He's complaining. When are you going to do something about this? This is your fault. If you were who you said you were, we wouldn't be in this mess right now. It's an incredible contrast. But this one, he, he knew he was guilty. Here's the point that I want to, here's the point I really want to drive home when it comes to guilt. There, there's a difference between recognizing your guilt and living in your guilt. Re he recognized his guilt. And there's a place for every one of us to come in our life where we recognize we are guilty before God. We have sinned against the holy God. We have, we have violated the law of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there's, there's, there's a point in every one of our lives where we need to recognize that I am a sinner. I am guilty. Will you forgive me? There's a difference between that and living in guilt. God does not want you to be living in guilt. He doesn't want you walking around feeling like you're guilty all the time. Have you seen that person? Always living in guilt. Maybe you are that person. You're like, oh, it's raining outside. They're like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I had a really bad day. I'm sorry. It's not your fault. They're just apologizing for everything. They're just living in guilt. I got this great Dane that, um, I, lo I love her. She's a, she's a great dog. I, I just, you know, but every once in a while, like I'll come home and she knows it's me. This happened, just, this happened just the other day. I come in the house and she knows she's not supposed to be, she's upstairs. I mean, she's not in my room, but on my bed, which I don't like that. And, and, and so I walk in the house and she's at the base of the step, and she's right down, <laughs> head down, right to the door where she knows I, you know, send her out, right? But it was like, if she, if she could talk, she'd be like, guilty, 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 guilty. You got me. I was caught. I'm caught. It just was like, and normally she's a great loving dog, but when she's done something, maybe you have a dog just like that. It's like, oh boy, I did it. You caught me. You caught me. It's all me. I had this other dog years ago, Frazier. Frazier was one of the, now, a big contrast, so Great Dane, big, 140-pound dog, then this Frazier, 15-pound little tabletop that walks around the house, right? <laughs> Frazier was very, I don't know if this dog was beat before we got it, I don't know what the story was with this dog, but this dog, you just looked at the dog, and he would relieve himself, and it's like, <laughs> and if the dog was 15 pounds, I want to tell you, 14 pounds of it was liquid. And my wife and I would think to ourselves, like, how does that dog have so much 
fluid in her. And like, you just be sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. Like, it's empty. It's like this, it's like this, this bladder that just never ended. But the dog, it was like you just had a look at the dog. The dog lived in guilt all the time. It was like it was just, you just had a look in that direction. And it was just right away, oh, it just started relieving itself. And I know people that are like that. Not that they go relieving themselves all over the place, but there's people who feel like there is everything that happens around them is their fault. Somewhere along the line, somebody whispered something into their head that they are just the cause for everything bad in the world. And Jesus doesn't want anyone to live like that. There's a difference between being guilty and living in guilt. There is that convicting work of the Holy Spirit that he, the Holy Spirit puts his finger on something and says, you're guilty of this. Repent and it's over, right? If we'll confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we recognize we're sinful and we don't go to God, we start walking in that guilt and then everything's our fault. Jesus sets us free from guilt. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Romans 6, God forbid, how shall we who are dead to sin live any longer there in it? There's no need to walk in those things any longer. Jesus sets us free from guilt. It's important to remember that because what happens is when people walk in guilt and they don't experience the freedom that God has for them in Jesus Christ and they continue to walk in guilt, it progresses to the third thing that I want to bring to you that Jesus sets us free from. It progresses to shame. Guilt, when you allow yourself to live under it long enough, progresses to feelings of shame shame. The sad thing about the one who lives in shame is they fail to recognize the valuable price tag that God places on their lives. They don't realize how special they are, how unique they are, how valuable they are to God. When a person lives in shame, they usually find themselves in in abusive relationships because they have totally lowered the bar as to how they ought to be treated. They've lived in guilt long enough and they've come to the conclusion that they're less than what God says about them and they start moving in in shame and they become a, a very good target for somebody who'll scoop right in and take advantage of that situation. It happens all the time. You spend enough time ministering and working with teenagers and you start to see patterns that start developing. Young girl hooks up with a young boy and it turns the wrong direction. Innocence is lost. Young boy hooks up a young girl Innocence is lost. The first thing they feel, guilt. Oh, if we could just capture that, that, that look on the face of that one the next day that says, what did I do? It starts with guilt. And if that guilt is not properly taken to the right location, the cross that person starts living a guilty, feeling guilty, a guilty life. And that guilt over time begins to evolve into shame. And that young boy, that young girl starts to think, well, I guess that's just the way I am. And they'll just settle for anybody who will treat them, give them any kind of attention. And it start, it's a vicious cycle of guilt and shame that lends itself to a very dysfunctional lifestyle. God never wants you to live in shame. Listen, God will introduce and bring, and bring guilt 
into your life. So that, because there's, we're, there's guilt, right? I mean, haven't you been, been guilty before? Right? Guilt. Yeah, go did it. My fault. It's all me. I own it. Right? The Holy Spirit will bring guilt into our life, not to make us feel guilty, but to help us understand we are guilty. Right? And he does that not so that we can feel guilty, but so that we can go to the only one who can free us from that guilt. But God never, listen, God never operates in the arena of shame. God will never make you feel shameful. Less than. That is not the work of the Holy Spirit. That is not the work of God. It might be the work of some Christians. It might be some of the work of some of your past experiences. It might be some of the work, certainly the work of the enemy. But it is not the work of God. God never wants you to walk around in shame, feeling undervalued. Jesus values the people who the world is quick to point a finger at and disregard. Remember, it was a religious leader, a religious community that was disgusted with Jesus because he was a friend of sinners. It was Jesus who surrounded himself with with tax collectors. It wasn't like Jesus went after them. They just came to him. Tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes and women caught in the the, the act of adultery and 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 religious leaders that were like 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 Nicodemus who were disgruntled with the things that they they all found themselves in the presence of Jesus. Why? Why 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 was Jesus befriended by sinners? It wasn't because he condoned their sin, but he removed their guilt. He, he washed the shame away and restored the dignity of that person who was made in the image of God, and they didn't want to sin. Remember Jesus saying to the woman caught in the act of adultery? Where are your accusers? No, they're not here, Lord. Well, neither do I accuse you. Now go and sin no more. Jesus brings dignity, not shame. The Holy Spirit will bring guilt. So guilt should drive us to repentance, and repentance brings us to freedom. Neither do I condemn you. Go and, and sin no more. There's a progression to these points, if you haven't noticed it already. People turn to vices, and which oftentimes leads to guilt, which leads to shame, which sometimes can lead to Religion. I want you to know that the last freedom that Jesus wants people to experience is freedom from religion. Not freedom from a relationship with God. How many of those two things are very different? God wants us to experience freedom from religion because religion doesn't bring freedom, it brings bondage. That's what Paul was teaching the church at Galatia. This church that was turning back to the works of the law, this church that had experienced salvation by faith alone in Christ alone, they experienced that salvation was by by faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul is writing to the church at Galatia. Now, just just by way of background, it it wasn't just one church in in Galatia. It It was a region of churches. It was a number of churches within the region of Galatia. And they were people who had come to Christ. They had had experienced freedom from religion and freedom from vices and and practices from their their pagan days. They found freedom from guilt and and shame, and and they were walking in truth for some time. But then some false teachers crept into the church. And they they were encouraging people and directing people and saying, if you really want to please God, if you want the favor of God, if you want the grace of God, which is really what what grace is, God's unearned favor. If you want God's grace, if you want God's goodness and and being in faith, if you want God's favor, you've got to do some things. You've got to go back to the works of the law. And so that was what was starting to happen in the church of Galatia. They were returning back to doing things. These works, these religious systems that were never capable of of saving people in the first place. But people started to believe these lies. And they slowly began to pull away from the grace of God. 
and engaged in works and, and with every step towards works that they took came more bondage. And people were being deceived into thinking that God's favor came by their religious efforts. And so Paul writes this letter to the churches in Galatia to set the record straight. And he does it so lovingly, so gently, so pastorally. And he says, Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Isn't that gentle? So he says in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1. Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Are you crazy? Who has placed a spell on you? It was before your eyes that Jesus was publicly betrayed as crucified. You saw that he did everything that was necessary for you. He says, I have only got to ask you one question. Now, when, when the Apostle Paul says, I'm only going to ask you one question, it's going to be a doozy. Like, it's like, all right, let me just kind of buckle up for this because it's going to be a good one. Bring it. Here we go. Right? I'm only going to ask you this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Simple question. How did you come to Jesus? Did you come to Jesus by faith? Or did you come to Jesus by the works of the law? Because as, 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 as Jews outside of Christ... Didn't, don't you remember the law wasn't really working for you? Don't you remember how you, you violated every part of it? Don't you remember how it was putting you in such bondage? Let's just go back to the beginning. I, let's just take a moment of pause. Step back here. When you started this thing, was it by faith in Jesus? Or was it by your works? How many, got, how many came to Christ at their worst person, when they were at their worst possible state? Right, like it was like you know maybe at the bottom at the bottom of the barrel. Not everybody was, but like some of us were. You're at the bottom of the barrel, right? And we're at our worst possible state, and Jesus scooped us up. Isn't it interesting? That, and as as time goes on, you blow it a couple of times, and you think all of a sudden, like God's sick of you. Like for all, if, if it was all based on your works and your merits and your morals, um, you're probably better off than you ever were before. And so, if you started by faith, why do you think? your works are going to secure and finish the work. That's what Paul is saying here. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now going to be perfected by the flesh? What a great, I love how he just uses logic and saying, wait a second, let's just go back to remember how this all started. You don't need religion. It's not about doing. It's about what's been done for you. Are you so foolish? He says in verse 10 of that same chapter, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. <laughs> it's like, all right, so hypothetically, do you want to be judged by the law? Okay. Cursed is everyone who doesn't abide by every part of the law. Is that what you want to use as your standard? You see, the, the reality of it is that, 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 that and, and, and Paul will mention this earlier, later on in Galatians, where, where he'll say, um, the law became our schoolmaster. It became our tutor. It became, the, the law was a tool that God gave us to help us realize we can't fulfill it. The goal, the plan, the purpose of the law is to help us realize we are sunk. We are as bad off as we possibly can be. The law says, I can't do this. And what it does is it points us to the only one who can. And that's the beauty of Christianity. It's the beauty of what God has done for us. That's why Jesus came to set us free from religion, for free from the do's and the don'ts and the works of the law and all those things that bring bondage into our lives. It says in verse, five, verse 1 of chapter 5, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. 
God doesn't want you and me trying to um, accomplish by our good efforts what's necessary to complete our salvation. You can never do it. There is none who was ever able to fulfill the law save one. He who came and lived perfectly. It's interesting. I mean, I don't think anybody here is old enough to... Did anybody else here um, eat of the tree in the garden? Nobody, right? So, so nobody here actually ate of the tree, but, but the consequence of that action was passed on down from Adam to us. You see, he was our representative. We're all going to thank him for that one day. Um, it's maybe why we'll be worshiping because he, he's here? You're incredible, God. Right? But you see, Adam was our representative. And so when Adam ate of the tree, he's no different than you and I eating of the tree. And so when guilt came on Adam, guilt then came on all the descendants. And so the, the sin that Adam brought upon himself was imputed. It was applied to our lives. And that's why man, it's what we call original sin. That's why man is born separated from God. It's why man is born as bad off as he possibly can be. But Romans speaks about a second Adam that came. One that didn't fold like a cheap suit in the garden. One that came out of heaven in the person of Jesus Christ and lived his life flawlessly, who obeyed every part of the law. And he took the punishment for every one of Adam's descendants upon himself when he didn't deserve it. And he went to the cross for you. Did anybody go to the cross? No, right? But he's our representative. In the same way that Adam was our representative in the garden, Jesus is our representative in the cross. And you see, there's nothing you can do to be a part, to have, to have Jesus represent you other than saying, I am guilty. You are, my, you are the only means by which I can have eternal life. I put all my trust in you. I embrace what you've done for me. That's the gospel, folks. That's what it's all about. Religion tries to add to what Jesus has done. Isn't that insulting? To suggest for one moment that what Christ has done on the cross isn't enough? Jesus came to set us free from religion so that we can have relationship with the God who created us. Religion is bondage. It never satisfies. It never, it never reconciles. It, it never brings wholeness because religion is what man makes up. It's man's attempt to get to God. It hasn't worked. It'll never work. Redemption is God's way of coming to man. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus sets us free from religion and offers us relationship, not based on what we do for him, but based on what he has done for us. And so we live lives. Does that mean we don't pray? Heck no. Does it mean we don't do good works? Absolutely not. Not. Does that mean that we don't have to do anything? No. But we don't do to gain God's favor. We do because we've been on the receiving end of God's favor. It's a response of what we've already received because of what Jesus has done, not a, a, an effort to attain for us something that only God can provide through Jesus Christ. And when humanity makes that connection, Freedom from vices, freedom from guilt, freedom from shame, freedom from religion, it then becomes our reality. And hope is restored. And God is glorified. And the hunt is over. Because we have found him who fulfills all of our needs. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you have given us what we can never earn ourselves. We pray, Lord, that the truth of this message would, would challenge our hearts this morning for those that um, find themselves in pursuit of vices. I pray, Lord, that you would 
help them to find hope and healing and help in Jesus Christ and, in, and then through one another here at the church. Help us to be that help as an extension of your love to them. Lord, free us of guilt and shame, those things that are not from you and keep us, that keep us from walking in the freedom that you have for us. He that the sun sets free is free indeed. God, I pray that every person in the, that hears my voice today would recognize that in Jesus and because of Jesus, Jesus only, that we can find hope and freedom today. If that's you this morning, you think to yourself, I've, I've just, maybe you've never come into saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never come to a point where you've asked Christ to come into your, your life and be your Lord and your Savior. And Maybe you're just listening online or, or wherever you're listening and, and, and this is kind of, you're just not yet sure that if your heart were to stop beating right now that you'd be with Jesus. Um, I want you to know you, you can seal that, settle that in your heart right now because everything that needs to be done so that you can have that assurance has been done for you already by Jesus going to the cross for you. All you need to do is receive that. And so if you're here this morning and ask you, just ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin. Just like the thief on the cross, no big hoops to jump through. Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive me my sin. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Pray that with all your heart, and God will meet you right where you're at. And you'll find the hunt is over when you find Jesus.